lecture is uh, also and perhaps mainly a keynote for the ongoing conference of the architecture of the regulations uh, organized by Hilal Matson and Katina Gabrielsson uh, here at KTH and at Modern Museet uh, tomorrow and then again here on Saturday. Uh, and uh, Glenn Frischow, Director of uh, Research Studies at KTH, will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, I'm going to do this Swedish style, which is a very interesting style, I think, of presenting someone, and it's a nice way of addressing them. So, Douglas Spencer, you are the author of The Architecture of Neoliberalism, which is going to be available on our shelves in September this year, which is really exciting, I think. You're also a regular contributor to Radical Philosophy, which I used to be a subscriber to until they criticised me, and then I decided to drop my subscription for a while. Um, <laughs> You've written chapters for recent collections on architecture, politics, and critical theory. In fact, we're both in the missed encounter of radical philosophy in architecture, which is nice. So we're, yeah, um, edited by Nadia Lahiji and, and came out in, it came out in 2014. And you're, you also have an essay in architecture against the post-political essays in reclaiming the critical project, also by Nadia, or edited by him. You've published numerous essays in journals such as the Journal of Architecture, AD, AA Files, New Geographies and Prasnim. You teach in History and Theory of Architecture in the Graduate School of Design at the Architectural Association of London and you're the program leader for the master's course Reading the Neoliberal City at University of East London. Welcome, we're really looking forward to hearing your lecture which is an excerpt out of um, Doug's uh, book that you really all must buy, obviously. Thanks very much. That is indeed a very disconcerting way to be introduced. I, I plead guilty on all counts. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for uh, Katerina and Helena for inviting me uh, to give this talk at this conference. Uh, thanks also to the other Katerina for all her, her efforts in, in the organisation of this as well. Um, so, yes, as Ellen says, this is a kind of hacked about version of uh, a chapter, the last chapter of the book, um, The Architecture of Neoliberalism. Uh, and kind of being the last chapter, I don't know if it should be the last chapter, but that's how it's going to be. But it's kind of the one I've most recently thought about. Um, just something we were discussing, or a number of people were discussing earlier this afternoon, was about people were talking about belief systems and the necessity of demolishing them, especially belief systems that architects are kind of adhering to. So, one way of of introducing what I want to do this evening is to say that I want to uh, demolish the belief system that it's good to have a purely sensuous enjoyment of architecture. And whilst I was thinking that that's what I was going to say, I was also thinking about how appropriate it is to say it in this particular space, given that so much of it is unclad and seems to be inviting some sort of immediate sensu sensuous enjoyment of its materiality. So what I'm going to do is, uh, to give you some orientation, is a kind of critical reconnaissance of the way in which uh, architecture and architectural discourse has embraced ideas of affect 
Um, and really the, the, uh, the time period I'm looking at here is, is really from the early to mid 90s up to the present day. So it kind of starts off uh, just at the, the edge of the, uh, the, the period in which this conference is framed. Um, but then having done that, I then jump back to kind of the mid 80s and look at architectural critique, uh, kind of centering around Jameson's infamous encounter with the Bonaventura Hotel in Los Angeles. Um, and so I, I, I then backtrack further back in history and bear with me while I do this, but I'm going to do a very, very quick run through that will go from, uh, that will go Camp Hegel, Mark to Dorno and Walk by And I, I, I will try and do it all quickly. Uh, Jameson and, and then up to present day, and I'll try and tie it all together somehow at the end. So, in, two, in the 2008 essay, The Politics of the Envelope, Alejandro Zaire Apollo notes a new tendency in architecture that's revealed in the contemporary treatment of the envelope. This is exemplified in Nouvelle's unbuilt Tokyo Opera, Geary's Guggenheim Museum, Future Systems Selfridges Department Store, OMA's Seattle Public Library and Casa de Musica, and Herzog and de Meuron's Prada Tokyo. Architectural expression is no longer channeled through traditionally established modes of articulation, but operates through uncoded, formal, geometric, and tectonic means. The features of the envelope's expressive service, surface have now, he writes, taken over the representational roles that were previously trusted to architectural language and iconographies. This newly discovered expressive capacity of the envelope coincides historically, claims Ayer Apollo, with a post-linguistic orientation within global capitalism. As language becomes politically ineffective, he writes, as language becomes politically ineffective in the wake of globalization, and the traditional articulations of the building envelope become technically redundant, the envelope's own physicality, its fabrication and materiality attract representational roles, end of quote. Drawing upon Deleuze and Guattari's concept of faciality, he models this shift of the envelope as a movement from language and signification towards what he calls a differential faciality which resists traditional protocols in which representational mechanisms can be precisely oriented and structured. Faciality, he claims, we don't need to worry overly about exactly what Deleuze and Guattari mean by that, but faciality is claimed here as a politics of the envelope. This is the title of his essay. A politics of the envelope that operates without getting caught in the negative project of the critical tradition or in the use of architecture as a mere representation of politics. This so-called faciality works instead through affect. This is what it says. The primary depository of contemporary architectural expression is now invested in the production of affects, an uncoded, pre-linguistic form of identity that transcends the propositional logic of political rhetoric. End of quote. So this turn to affect is supposed, in the immediacy of its expression, to have rendered interpretation redundant. Communication is now held to be pre-personal, transmitted, that is, by empathy between material organisations. Affect, it seems, circulates between one thing and another. There is neither subject nor object of interpretation. The politics of the envelope affirm and reproduce this truth. What exists is good 
Affect has also been privileged by Farshid Musavi in her The Function of Form. Here she argues that the contemporary city is no longer defined by a single culture, as if it was once, but is now a space where novel subcultures and identities are constantly emerging. Musavi asserts that architecture can no longer afford to structure itself as an instrument that either reaffirms or, re, uh, or resists a single static idea of culture. Instruments, codes, symbols, languages, etc., simply repeat without variation. As a function, rather than an instrument of contemporary culture, architectural forms need to vary in order to, act, uh, in order to address its plurality and mutability." End of quote. Now, given that this supposedly new condition is defined by multiplicity and multiculturalism, runs this argument, the use of language or any code is rendered obsolete. One can no longer presume what she calls the universal fluency of architecture's audience. She says that attempts to relate built forms and people through an external medium are therefore destined to remain marginal and ineffectual. Architectural, architectural form is assigned a task, unmediated by any established code, of communicating directly with what she calls the molecular nature of contemporary reality. Like Zaira Apollo, Musavi identifies changes within capitalism as key to the development of architectural forms now capable of addressing this plurality and mutability, uh, this reality of product differentiation and mass customization. A reality where capitalism is no longer an homogenizing force, but contributes to the production of difference and novelty. It might seem like I'm being savagely sarcastic by putting ragu spaghetti sauce in all its varieties <laughs> to illustrate this. This is the example she uses. Architecture, it follows, should pursue the same path, developing its own novel forms and thereby contributing to an environment that connects, into, excuse me, connects individuals to a multitude of choices. Musavi also turns to Deleuzean notions of affect in approaching the question of exactly how it is that these novel architectural forms might perform as a multiplicity uh, in a way that's adequate to post-linguistic, mutable, uh, and uh, pluralistic social reality. This is what she says. Through the agency of spatial affects, in each instance, an architectural form performs as a singular multiplicity, as a function that connects human beings to their environment as well as each other, albeit in different ways. In order to explore forms as multiplicities, designers need to focus on their affective functions. You might notice a, a common uh, kind of thread in the way these arguments are structured, which start off with saying capitalism has changed, there is a new reality, architecture has to be in tune with that reality, Therefore, I, the architect or the architectural theorist, are telling you what you need to do now in order to be adequate to that. Musavi offers FOA's Yokohama Court Terminal as exemplary of an architecture that performs as this kind of multiplicity. The shifting sectional profile and variable geometry of this complex form are said to result in multiple percepts and affects. This is where it gets really strange uh, because the, the words that are used to describe affects, which is a difficult proposition in itself if we're meant to be somehow coming after language. But anyway, this is how she describes them. Flatness, pleating, openness, axiality, efficiency, diagonality, asymmetry, purposefulness, landscape, valley, mountain, and so on. These supposed affects and percepts are held to ensure, in their variety and proliferation, 
that the terminal is not reducible to a single interpretation or meaning. Since the individual's perception of novel architectural forms uh, is, she argues, conditioned by his or her particular experience, she says that the reception is inevitably different in each case and therefore multiple. A later statement by Musavi suggests the essential incompatibility of practices of interpretation with an architecture of affect. Though built forms incorporate different material and intellectual contents, she says, these meld together into novel sensory forms, which, once created, are what they are. They have no cognitive content in their actuality. They are just formal, and their meaning depends on their affects and each individual's perception of them. So it's almost as if some kind of prohibitory sign is being put up against meaning. This uh, kind of tautology of things are what they are. Uh, Zaire Apollo and Musavi's account of affect in architecture originates in a broader affective term for which Brian Masumi's Parables for the Virtual has become a foundational text. Here he writes, uh, there seems to be a growing feeling within media, literary and art theory that affect is central to an understanding of our information and image-based late capitalist culture in which so-called master narratives are perceived to have founded. Frederick Jameson notwithstanding, he continues, uh, belief has waned for many, but not affect. If anything, our condition is characterized by a surfeit of it. Now, Masumi himself, uh, he's, uh, if you don't know of him through this, this publication, he's uh, a translator into English of Deleuze and Guattari. Masumi himself draws on Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari in formulating this concept of affect. In What is Philosophy, uh, Deleuze and Guattari identify affect as the modus operandi proper to art, understood as a being of sensation, existing apart from the conceptual or the referential in its immediate materiality. Deleuze, in his book, uh, Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation, affirms sensation as that which is transmitted directly and avoids the detour and boredom of conveying a story. Art as sensation, as it's being defined here, the painting of Cezanne or uh, Bacon, for instance, is in direct contact with the subject. He says that it acts immediately upon the nervous system, bypassing the intermediary of the brain. This might be a bit of a cheap shot. I was, I was talking to her then about this earlier and saying, I, I don't have much understanding of physiology, but I thought the brain was connected to the nervous system. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, Masumi, drawing upon these propositions, writes in Parables for the Virtual that the work of Deleuze and Guattari could be profitably read together with recent theories of complexity and chaos. It's all a question of emergence, uh, which is precisely the focus of the various science-derived theories that converge around the notion of self-organization. End of quote. Now, if the allure of Masumi's combination of Deleuze and complexity theory for all contemporary architects is already obvious, his appeals to affirmation and against criticality only make this more so. The problem with critical thinking, writes Masumi, is that it sees itself as uncovering something that it claims was hidden, or as debunking something that it desires to subtract from the world. Rather than subtracting, we should be adding. Critical thinking in the humanities, he says, is of limited value. The balance, he argues, has to shift to affirmative methods in order that it be positively productive. 
When you are busy critiquing, you are less busy augmenting. Addressed to the theory of art, Simon O'Sullivan's essay, The Aesthetics of Affect, and this is from 2001, adopts a similar line of argument. Uh, affect is conceived as art's fundamental essence. First Marxism, with its social history of art, and then Derridean deconstruction, have caused, he says, an aesthetic blindness due to which we fail to recognise this, misconstruing if we misconstrue art as an object of knowledge. Marxism and deconstruction are mistakenly focused on what he too calls negative critique. Art, he says, is not amenable to interpretation or critical reflection because affects are extra discursive and extra textual. Extra textual. Indeed, you cannot read affects, insists O'Sullivan. You can only experience them. In place of any analysis addressing the issue of why art should be understood exclusively in terms of affect, and this has a bearing on how architecture is understood as well, O'Sullivan deploys the kind of ontological assertions familiar from his counterparts in architecture. Affects, he says, are moments of intensity, a reaction in or on the body at the level of matter. We might even say that affects are imminent to matter. They are certainly imminent to experience. As such, affects are not to do with knowledge or meaning. Indeed, they occur on a different asignifying register. There's that prohibition again. The prohibition on interpretation. Furthermore, the turn to affect will relieve us of the depressive symptoms to which critical thinking has subjected us for too long. And you know who's going to come next here. Adorno, claims O'Sullivan, has abandoned the existent. His is a forsaken world. Indeed, this is what gives his work its melancholy, melancholy tenor. We might want to turn, he continues, of course, from Adorno to Deleuze and to a more affirmative notion of the aesthetic impulse. Now, O'Sullivan doesn't engage in an analysis of why this should be the case here either. As with Masumi, it seems enough simply to assert that it's better to be positive than to be negative. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. Now, the historical conditions with which Adorno's conception of aesthetics appeared we need to be reminded of those, the industrialization of culture, the instrumentalization of nature, the rise of fascism, the Holocaust, are passed over. The possibility that these concerns, rather than Adorno's personal mental failings, might have imbued his work with its melancholy tenor, are left unconsidered. Regardless of context, art and philosophy alike should abandon their utopian pursuits and become pragmatic, functional, above all, productive. <coughs> I was um, intrigued when I realised that Ellen had, had also been looking at uh, Sylvia Lavin and her kissing in architecture, and I'm going to refer to that a little now as well. Um, so Sylvia Lavin takes the immersive installation art, Hippolotti Wrist, as her point of access to an affirmation of affect in architecture. Wrist's Pour Your Body Out, exhibited in the atrium of New York's Museum of Modern Art in 2008, is described as a multi-channel immersive video 25 feet high that wrapped the museum's traditional white walls with a soft psychedelic garden of Eden populated with a prelapsarian Eve, apples and animalism. The installation also included pink curtains and a gigantic soft grey donut shaped puff where scores of people jostled for comfy spots blanketed by the oozing pinkish soundtrack. Wrist's concept, notes Levin, was in the words of the artist, not to de destroy 
or be provocative to the architecture, but to melt in as if I would kiss Taniguchi. Rather than literally kissing the deceased architect of MoMA, Rift <laughs> achieved this by filling its modernist space with sensuous bodies pouring in and out. The artist, suggests Lavin, was speaking of a new sensibility that could envelop and suffuse the older ones. Those older ones being authority and autonomous intellection in the sensory embrace of intense affect. Intensity, feeling, immediacy, all the usual promises of affect are captured in Lavin's kissing. So too are the typical renunciations of language and interpretation. No one can speak when kissing. Kissing interrupts how faces and facades communicate, substituting affect and force for representation and meaning, dispensing with the cold and cognitive logics of modernism and following the lead of Deleuze towards feeling and sensation, architecture should make its newly pliant surfaces kissable. And this practice is, is exemplified for Levin in uh, the work of UN Studio, Preston Scott Cohen, Delos Cofidio and Renfro and others. The kissing architectural surface of such architecture, writes Levin, is neither kitchen nor avant-garde, neither legible and demanding of focused attention, or simply edible and erotic. It is instead affective and indebted because it shapes experience through force rather than representation. Okay, so yeah, so this is the, the last one of the arch architects and architectural theorists writing about affect. Lars Spoybrook. For Lars Spoybrook, meaning is a horrible word that lets us believe that the mind can trade aesthetics for textual interpretation. In his The Sympathy of Things, Ruskin and the Ecology of Design, he, like Musavi, refuses any cognitive component to aesthetics. Aesthetics, I argue, is ontology. The tautology is coming again here. Things are as they are, aesthetically, or as some would say, because they have an effect, or as others would say, because they affect each other. The term preferred by Spoybrook is sympathy, the felt relation between things in a world populated by things exclusively. Sympathy defines the power of things at work, he says, working between all things and between us as things. No special privileges are conceded to the subject. Humans, says Spoybrook, are nothing but things among other things. Ideas, agency, and intelligence exist, he acknowledges, but these are equalized out amongst and between things. They are evenly distributed, rather than centered in any subject exterior to them. Matter, he writes, can think perfectly well for itself. Now, if matter does not require us to think on its behalf, or act upon it from without, then we can relinquish our compulsion to master the world, surrender ourselves over to a feeling for things. The 20th century, our true dark ages, can be left behind. Among the horrors that define it as such for Spoybrook, including those of Auschwitz and the H-bomb, special mention is reserved for by now familiar objects of censure. Making it into the 21st century, he writes, we even survived semiotics and deconstruction, and criticality too. <laughs> the turn to affect, affect, sorry, demands the disavowal of critique, a renunciation of interpretation, of representation, of mediation. The 21st century, it seems, should embrace positive feeling and renounce negative thinking. The argument for this is ontological, or attempts to be. Its proofs lie in the immediacy of matter, its sensuous forms, and its sympathetic relations. The argument is also ethical, or wants to be. The horrors of the 20th century are understood as resulting from a Promethean hubris of which critique is equally culpable. <coughs> 
all forms of mastery, whether they be over humanity, nature, or meaning, are expressions of the same cold and unfeeling logic of reason. Operating under the illusion that it exists, that it exists apart from and above the nature of things, the effect of this supposedly faulty logic have been socially, politically, and environmentally catastrophic. One of the problems, just one of the problems with this schema, is that it makes no discrimination between the traumas of the 20th century and the forms of critique that have attempted to comprehend their larger causes. In refusing to countenance the possibility of mediation, the way is effectively barred to the possibility of apprehending reality in relation to any larger set of forces beyond immediate impressions, to a totality defined not as a collection of separate unrelated things, but as a whole in which everything depends on everything else, as Frederick Jameson wrote in Marxism and Form. The attempt to grasp the totality through particular instances of its mediation is delegitimized, both because there's nothing to grasp, it's supposed or argued, uh, beyond the immediately obvious and its exclusively sensuous existence, and because the attempt to do so, which is counted as a work of totalizing, is in itself understood as somehow implicated in totalitarianism. So things just are as they are and should be left to be so. And this accords, in effect, with the neoliberal truth game by which we are disqualified from making conscious plans for society on the basis of our necessary ignorance of the social order. Its workings are beyond, their, beyond our ken, so beyond our knowledge. Um, and any attempt to grasp these in order to consciously direct them leads inevitably to totalitarianism. So the turn to effect wants to bring to an end, as if drawing some unfortunate episode to a close, the various practices of critical thought that sought for much of the 20th century to comprehend the abstract logics and forces of capital through the cultural forms in which they were mediated. So this is what you know, much or you know, pretty much everything Jameson writes about in one way or another is about, about trying to understand capitalism, late capitalism as a totality through the film, through the novel and through architecture. So we might take uh, Jameson's Bonaventura Hotel um, as some kind of significant marker point in, in that project too. How am I doing for time? Yep, okay. We're more than halfway through. So this is where I start going into the um, the trawl through uh, history of critique. Um, so, I won't say too much about this because I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, are familiar with this sort of infamous, infamous encounter uh, of, of by uh, Frederick Jameson, his encounter with the Bonaventura Hotel in Los Angeles, where he reflects on the problem of how the totality is mediated through the built environment of the late 20th century. So for Jameson, the Bonaventura is exemplary of what he calls something like a mutation in built, in built space itself. And this mutation, he says, is a type of evolution with which the human subject has not kept pace. Inside, Jameson finds the suppression of depth characteristic of postmodern post art and cinema realised in architectural form. A bewildering immersion, he calls it, disorientating the visitor. For Jameson, this latest mutation in space has finally succeeded in transcending the capacities of the individual human body to locate itself, cognitively to map its position in a mappable external world. So it's a kind of crisis point he recognises it as. And he says this new spatial condition 
stands as something like an imperative to grow new organs, to expand our sensorium and our body to some new, as yet unimaginable, perhaps ultimately impossible, dimensions. Now, Jameson's account of his encounter with the Bonaventura is critically reflective of the fact that the very trouble of its form, the very indiscernibility of its form, presents an obstacle to the type of critique he is trying to practice. So it's like he kind of, he, he and the whole kind of project of a kind of critical analysis of architecture as mediation of capital kind of runs aground here and he, he kind of owns up to it, which is fascinating and, and very significant, I think. He says, I am at a loss when it comes to conveying the thing itself, the experience of space you undergo when you step into the lobby or atrium. So Jameson's analysis of the Bonaventura questions the ability of the subject to adapt itself to the environments it now finds itself immersed in. It reflects on the obstacles to critique caused by the loss of depth and distance, on the difficulties in even locating a position from which to reflect critically upon experience. Now the turn to affect in architecture of course, not explicitly or directly, but I, I think in some way it answers to this very crisis by claiming that the whole project of critique is now redundant. The struggle of the subject to orientate itself within the immersive architectural environment, to locate itself within a condition of depthlessness, in order to understand it, is overcome in the enjoyment of immediacy in the subject giving itself over to the sensuous pleasures of immersion. The frustrations of the critic are overcome in the cancellation of both the object and the practice of critique. There is nothing beyond appearances after all. Thinking can be done well enough by things themselves. What the turn to affect demands in order to achieve this, however, is a further and more fundamental schism within the subject. The partition of feeling from knowledge. The way in which it <coughs> affirms a purely sensuous, post-linguistic and unreflective, ex of, uh, unreflective experience of the world returns us, in some sense, to an older notion of aesthetics as pure sensation. So, as Terry Eagleton notes, I'm just going to quote him at a little bit of length here, aesthetics is born as a discourse of the body in its original formulation by the German philosopher Alexander Baumgarten. The term refers not in the first place to art, but as the Greek, but as the Greek aesthesis would suggest, to the whole region of human perception and sensation, in contrast to the more rarefied domain of conceptual thought. So the type of history that Eagle, Eagleton is trying to chart is that from the Enlightenment it's, it's realised that there's this kind of realm which is seemingly not amenable to reason. Therefore it's a kind of threat to it, or, or perceived as such. While sensation remains uncharted, it threatens power. And so therefore it too must be colonised by reason. Aesthetics mediating between reason and sensation is instrumental to this process. In addressing itself to the new forms of subjectivity characteristic of this period, so those of the emergent bourgeoisie, power appropriates new modes of control. The ultimate binding force of the bourgeois social order, writes Eagleton, in contrast to the coercive apparatus of absolutism, will be habits pieties, sentiments, and affections. And this is equivalent to saying that power in such an order has become aestheticized. It's at one with the body's spontaneous impulses, entwined with sensibility and the affections, lived out in unreflective custom. End of quote. So power will operate through its investment in the subjective realm newly disclosed to reason. 
the individual is subject to forms of training that remain unreflected upon, precisely because they appear as customary and habitual, as given. So, here we go. Kant's critical philosophy presents a challenge to this in its account of the reflective capacities of the subject. For Hegel, however, Kant's critique is insufficiently critical in the limitations it sets upon the exercise of reason. So Hegel very crudely wants to say, you know, reason can do more, the subject has, has more capacity and more potential. For Kant, reason is reflective and contemplative, but for Hegel, reason is a form of praxis. Um, and so, it's through reason that the world that appears as given is shaped, and through reason that the subject can grasp this fact cognitively. We've been talking a lot about agency this afternoon, and the, the agency of the, the architect. What, what's at stake here, really, is the, is the subject being an agent of reason, and not just subject to it. So this in turn serves as a basis for the subject to act upon the world, to question and transform the given. For Hegel, uh, as Selah Ben Habib argues, we become individuals in that we shape, transform and reappropriate the given content of our desires inclinations and needs by reflecting upon them, by doing those things that we're uh, seemingly prohibited from doing by the discourse of affect. So in the 20th century, critical theory builds upon these understandings and their development through Marx in order to critique the instrumentalization of reason within industrial capitalism, the alienation of labor, the exploitation of nature and the commodification of culture are subjected to a defetishizing critique that originates in Hegel. What appears as given is shown to be the product of a praxis in which the subject might also be consciously and actively engaged. Setting out this very proposition in uh, traditional and critical theory, Max Horkheimer argues that the appearance of the world is to be grasped as historically and socially produced. So this is like the, the kind of obvious thing that we know about critical theory, that it's not natural. Something equally significant here though. Not only this, but the forms of perception through which the world is apprehended as such are themselves to be understood as socially and historically produced. The facts, he says, the facts which our senses present to us are socially preformed in two ways, through the historical character of the object perceived and through the historical character of the perceiving organ. Both are not simply natural. They are shaped by human activity. If the task of critical theory, then, is to reason against reason's own instrumentalization, to defetishize what appears as given within capitalism, then the ways in which the activities of the senses themselves appear as given must also be subject to critique. The sensuous and the sensible are to be amenable to cognitive reflection. Adorno, in his aesthetic theory, insists, if to come back to the melancholy guy, Adorno in his aesthetic theory insists on the inseparability of the sensuous and the cognitive in the perception of the artwork. You can't separate those two things, he says. Each work, if it's to be experienced, requires thought, however rudimentary it might be. And because this thought does not permit itself to be checked, each work ultimately requires philosophy as the thinking comportment that does not stop short in obedience to the prescription stipulated by the division of labor. That division of labor would be the division between uh, the, the sensuous and the intellectual. He's trying to overcome that. 
all perception for a doorknob necessarily involves, without being reducible, to cognition. Not knowing what one sees or hears, he argues, bestows no privilege direct relation to works, but instead makes their perception impossible. Consciousness is not a layer in a hierarchy built over perception, rather all elements of aesthetic experience are reciprocal. <coughs> Sensory reception and intellectual reflection together afford access to what he terms the truth content of the artwork. Grasping this truth content, which I'm not going to go into the fact before, grasping this truth content, states Adorno, postulates critique. <coughs> Last page. Architecture's turn to affect refutes critique, denying any place to reflection or reason within the subject's experience of the world. The partition of feeling from knowledge advocated by its proponents, if realisable, if ever realised, would return the subject to an essentially pre-philosophical, pre-critical position, to Eagleton's aestheticisation of power which is at one with the body's spontaneous impulses, uh, lived out in unreflective custom. Today, the totality, the condition which, as Jameson says, everything depends on everything else, can hardly be said to have disappeared, so that it no longer warrants critical reflection, given, amongst other things, the intensively networked and electronically mediated conditions of the contemporary world. So if this is the case, if things are more connected, more mediated in the early 21st century than they were in the mid 20th century, then to insist that experience constrains itself to the immediately sensuous should be understood, excuse me, should be understood as a repressive mechanism of the very totality it refuses perception access to. The schism between sensation and cognition is a function of the totality rather than the evidence for its non-existence. An architecture of affect performs as a power of aestheticization. Its work is to absorb the sensorium in an environmental patterning with which the subject can identify. Its work is to absorb, sorry, uh, and by recognising that things just are as they are. Recognising itself as a thing amongst other things. As a neoliberal subject, as operationally agile and efficient as are the forms with which its, with which its milieu is increasingly saturated. A good neoliberal subject who knows how to observe the proper limits of its own of its own reasoning capacities, and who knows how to enjoy its sensory rewards. Where any attempt to critically comprehend the totality is charged with being in itself somehow equivalent to totalitarianism, where the end of language, representation and interpretation are celebrated and presented as a fait accompli, the subject is not augmented. It's robbed of its potential, of what critical theory had, in fact, sought to add to its powers of cognition. In fact, it's the affirmation of affect and not the practice of critique that subtracts from perception in reducing it to a condition of pure aesthesis. Thank you. Karina and Helen have given me a completely impossible job because if I go all the way in your direction, I have to go to my studio and take all my Deleuze library off my shelf and shred it, right? Deleuze is a dangerous character. <laughs>
No, obviously not. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> kind of really shaking your head at me. Because, of course, I have to confess to being someone who's read Deleuze for the last 20 years. And Katerina and I, um, with our colleague Jonathan Metzger, uh, basically Deleuze and the city is going to be arriving in our post box any day now. So we've got a vested project with Deleuze. Right. And so part of my job today has to be, I don't want to have to apologise for Deleuze, I want to kind of argue for what we can still, how Deleuze still okay. helps us to think. And this is the direction I'm going to attempt to take. Okay. And, and we, we might have a battle on our hands, but that, that's good, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Of course, I, I'm, I'm living in another paradox because I'm a reader of Deleuze, but I work in a department or a research and um, teaching group called Critical Studies in Architecture. So I read Deleuze, but supposedly I also do critique, which might seem paradoxical according to the system you've laid out. Yeah. Okay, but in any case, I think what we've heard today is, um, yet again, the story of a kind of capture of the concept on the part of the architect, and how, how um, uh, something is made use of the concept. Perhaps we could even describe it as the deregulation of the concept. Um, the concept set free on the marketplace, uh, gaining value, collecting surplus value even. Um, we have uh, concepts that are becoming more competitive, more efficient, more flexible. Um, we, we, uh, we have the concept of affect and how it's been mobilised in architectural discourse. And a very specific kind of architectural discourse that's directed at a sort of projective attitude, I think. Um, an argument for the project and um, how, how we engage with it without having to go through the brain and ignoring that the brain might also be part of the nervous system. Okay, so we have this genealogy, you know, we've got the long story of um, architects reading Deleuze, and Deleuze is one of the key characters here, of course, um, as you spell out. Uh, you know, yeah, we've done the fold, we've done the diagram, we've done smooth space versus uh, striated, we've done the rhizome, but hey, now we can do affect. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and this is going to do a bunch of fantastic stuff for us. And um, yes, it's true, Deleuze and Guattari have these well-known refrains, you know, it's not a question of meaning, it's a matter of use. This yep. is a refrain that recurs again and again and again. But actually, when I, I think when they're talking about meaning here, they're, they're really responding to this kind of perceived dogma on their part at that their particular moment, which is phenomenology. Yes. It's an anti-phenomenological mm -hmm. argument. But they're not discarding a certain idea of sense. And they're certainly not, I would say, discarding critique. And they have their own critical project. In any case, I'm going to lead up to a bunch of questions. I hope that's OK. Yep. First, I'm going to rant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I think also that there are, uh, you know, you've cited Masumi and, um, and, and the seminal text, and of course Masumi is, is drawing on Deleuze, and, and um, then we've heard from O'Sullivan, who's kind of doing many of the same moves, it, it seems, as Masumi, and then we've heard the story of how architects have taken it up again and again, and this fantastic celebration of, you know, um, hey, things can speak for themselves, which with the design research turn in architecture becomes extremely dangerous. So, because this is an argument that we hear with respect to design practice research, where, where it's at its worst end of the spectrum of design practice research. That is, I'm going to do a PhD, it's going to be based on my architectural practice, I don't want to write too many words, I have too much theory, because my architecture will speak for itself. Mm -hmm. So they can use these arguments really well, right? Yeah. Dangerous. And I completely want to acknowledge the danger of it. Um, but there are, also, there are also kind of people who've been reading Deleuze for a long time. I'm thinking of people like Claire Colebrook, so we can put a woman here in the story, which is nice. And she's got much the same argument as you. And, um, you know, so I just want to quote her a bit. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. We are suffering today, here and now, from hyper-hypo-affective disorder. We appear to be consuming nothing other than affects. So she's right in with you on this one. Even the supposed material needs of life food, sex, sociality, are now marketed affectively. Branding relies on irrational attachments or love marks, while politics trades in terror and resentment. Affects themselves are marketed. One can purchase games of horror or disgust, and even the purchase of a cup of coffee is perhaps undertaken less for the sake of the caffeine stimulant and more for the Starbucks affect. So there's a full recognition in a bunch of Deleuze scholarship about the dangers of affect. And the long history in, um, in, in theory and um, 
philosophy and uh, cultural studies um, of the affect, the, uh, aff the turn toward affect. Um, and you haven't named, I suppose, people like, um, you know, the affect theory reader with uh, Melissa Gregg and Greg Seachworth. Uh, not to mention the fact that there's going to be a second affect theory reader coming our way because they just had a conference last year in the States. So more affect is on the horizon. But I have hopes because I think that um, your, your discussion has kind of used a very specific definition of affect. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether we, when, we're, we're not missing part of the picture and um, this issue of power that is obviously important for you um, comes up. And power's operating a couple of ways for you in, in your discussion, I, I think, here. Um, because you want to use it positively and negatively, I think. You, you want to call on the powers of critique as well as being wary of, of the um, power of affect. Um, but uh, one of the key sources that Deleuze is drawing on is, of course, the Neutza, where power plays a really important role and where affect isn't simply the autonomy of affect, but the maybe it's formulated by now, but the capa a capacity, the capacity to affect and be affected, which actually sets up into, us into some political and ethical relation. Yeah. So then we're moving beyond this kind of autonomy of affect argument, the sort of half second delay in which the body's responding, yeah. Yeah. and we're talking about a potential for kind of some kind of ethics mm -hmm. um, that isn't just, you know, the story you're telling is of this, these dark, this really dark picture of a fully morselated reality with individual bubbles of affect, yes. not communicating with each other, things thinking on their own, that's the universe. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't match the Deleuze, um, Spinoza universe right. where it's, it is about relation and the relation can be political and it can be about, um, it can be about ethics. Um, so, all right, so that's gonna get me to my question. Then, uh, because now that I've had my rant, <laughs> no, 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 this is just me. This is just me ranting. Okay, now because I, I also agree that we can't let go of critique, and we do have to remember that Deleuze is involved in projects such as his essays, Critical and Clinical, where he has his own take on how to undertake critique. Um, but there's a very particular lineage that you've set up and articulated for us. Um, we've got Kant, Hegel, Marx, Adorno, Horkheimer. And then at the end, I'm going, well, we've got Doug. So <laughs> I'm going, well, how do we do this work today? Because we can assume that, you know, this long lineage disconnected with, you know, amendments, additions, yeah. um, so forth. Um, some of them are helpful for us. We need to understand that genealogy. But how do we undertake the work today, especially when we are faced with the more pernicious renditions of effect? And you know how I hate yeah. Sylvia Levin's Kissing Architecture, because you've heard me speaking about that nasty pink little book. Um, so, 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 Doug, give us the answer then. What do we do? What is to be done? So where's okay. Doug's at the end of the genealogy? Give us some, no. give us some user's um, guides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I might have to ask you to remind me of that question because I want to respond just to some of the other okay, stuff. Okay, that's fine. Quickly. Okay, so... Yeah, I don't see Deleuze in, in black and white, in those black and white terms. In, I suppose I kind of speak with a bit of a passion because I'm a, an apostate. I started doing my PhD wanting to write about the kind of corruption of Deleuze and Guattari's thought by architects and ended up, and then ended up being quite realising I could be quite critical of Deleuze and Guattari as well, although they weren't, um, they couldn't escape some sort of critique. But, um, and the larger point really is, is not to be for or against Deleuze or, or Spinoza, I'd probably acknowledge those, those arguments and um, the validity of certain of their, their arguments and positions. You're asking kind of what, what is to be done now. And I, I certainly, I was, there's one other thing I want to say, is when I'm talking about the, the kind of schism between you know, sensuous enjoyment and, and cognition. I'm just lifting that wholesale from Adorno because he is misre misrepresented as being not kind of, you know, Mr. No Sensuous Enjoyment. It's quite understandable why, if you've seen him 
complaining about Joan Baez and folk music and it's <laughs> failure to have a, a properly, rigorously avant-garde musical form in response to the, the Vietnam War. But he was interested in the, the kind of dialectic between the concept and the, the concrete experience and concrete specificity. So I think we have to kind of put that back in, in, our, in our picture of him as well. Um, and as I say, not at all uh, ignorant of or uninterested in the sensuous. In fact, most of Adorno's writings about music uh, there's only one thing ever about architecture. Really. And I don't think it's a, it's a simple case, that I'm arguing of saying, well, you know, the post-critical came and demolished critical theory and now we need to bring it all back in. You know, like that, that's that, you know, swap around the stuff on bookshelves or rebuy the stuff we burnt, burnt in the 90s. <laughs> But I think we need to look at it again, because I, I think there, there is a lot to be taken from it and to start building on again. I think Dorno is, is, to me, is quite central to that. I think there are, uh, you know, still everyone talks about Foucault, I can't come disagree, his, his work on, on biopolitics is very interesting. Um, so. I'm, I'm always quite struck by this. There's a tiny little footnote somewhere in an interview with Foucault where he says, do you know what, I wish I'd read the Frankfurt School much earlier. It would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> so the notion that, that Foucault is somehow this kind of virulent anti-Marxist doesn't quite sit properly either. So, okay, so your advice to us is we, we need to reinterrogate Frankfurt School and get a, get kind of get back into a bit of a, a Adorno to revive aspects of the critical project. But, that, but then I want to ask, yeah. you, it really is beginning to sound like an either or, either it's affect or it's critical theory. And so I'm wondering whether we're not being given certain ways of accessing and understanding of the prevalence of affect, mm. and that we need certain of these thinkers who are engaged in the affect theory turn. Mm. Um, to help us think that way. So, I mean, Nigel Thrift is a rather irritating person to read because he's all over the place. But he yeah. sort of di he directs us and he says, we need to watch out for this and understand yes. how a affect is operating yeah. in our urban environments. Claire Colebrook kind of mm. does this work too and also refers back to Jamison and says, actually, there's something in this waning of affect because we've got to remember that um, uh, maybe it's not that we've got a surfeit of affect, we've got a surfeit of affections and we've got a closing down of yes our responses to the yep. environment yep. is the, another alternative. But yeah, no, I, I would have no problem with that, I, I think. I think that's a really good kind of proposition. Uh, so, for instance, we, we heard earlier today a number of people uh, talking about, going back to Foucault, him saying, power now operates in neoliberalism as it's emerging environmentally. Now, one strategy for that, and it's not so far from what Tafuri says about the relationship between architecture and urbanism. You have Pierre Vittorio Arelli's strategy, which is you know, more and more popular. This is like the official opposition to what I'm critiquing, which is to say, we refuse that. Architecture is an object. We will treat it as an object. We will treat it as form um, and insist on that, and therefore that's its politics. I don't think though, I think you have to you know, kind of stop looking at architecture as objects and yes. start look at, looking crit critically understanding the environment. So equally, I'm not going to say don't look at affect, I say we do need to look at it very closely. So, so I think I would absolutely agree with you there. But I, I also think that rather than simply saying we need to revive critical theory, the very essence of critique is that it's always imminent to what it's critiquing. So we have to understand that, that yes, so it is a critique of affect. And we have to acknowledge, related to this, the prevalence of uh, materialism, <laughs> the wrong type of materialism, not the historical or dialectical, but the notion of uh, new materialism, new materialism too, which comes from object the object oriented theory, ontologies, yes. all these. Um, kind of so-called ontologies equalise everything, 
and deny, this is kind of, I guess, what I'm really insisting on, deny what I was saying Hegel talks about, which is, you know, don't we have at least the potential to critically reflect, reflect reason so we're not just subject to, but we can be agents of our world as well. And this is even something, you know, more recently, I'm just dipping my toe into uh, Badiou, and him saying something along these lines about, you know, we're not, we don't need to be slavish to the apparently immediate material environment in which we find ourselves. But subjectivity is some sort of achievement that gives us some distance, that gives us some capacity that if, you know, that we might well want to hang on to and cultivate further. But this is also coming back to how perhaps we've, um, we've been, uh, we've given the human subject rather a hard time in this, the human subject who's sort of, uh, meanwhile become responsible for this, you know, uh, yet another buzzword, the Anthropocene at the yes. centre of this picture. And it's like, well, you know, um, we've been bashing the human subject a little bit, and Foucault's been talking about the line in the sand, and we should neither be happy nor sad that the human subject disappears yes. off the world historical scene. Yeah. In fact, all of Claire Colbrook is about, well, you know, so, essays on extinction, this is what we're looking toward, mm. we shouldn't get so upset about it. You want to push a bit back against that and yeah, say, well, yeah. no, we need to raise up this human subject, the human subject still has something that they can offer. Yeah. Well, I think you only have to, I would hope you only have to think very briefly about what it means to think about human subjects as objects, historically, to think about the implications of that, or look at the world around us now. I think I should now stop being greedy and see whether we've got also some questions from the audience. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, please, Emma. Oh, okay. Thank you for the lecture and the response. It was very interesting hearing you. But um, I would like to open up this discussion a bit because the, when I hear this, I think about, I mean, uh, the discourse around F affect it is, of course, tied into other discourses. And uh, one could historicize this too. I mean, it's a, the, the whole discussion around the post-criticalism the post from the start in a way an American discussion uh, and it's very kind of located in time in the late 90s and early 2000. Mm -hmm. It has uh, polarities between the East and the West uh, um, and it's also related to the growing digital revolution so to say. Yeah. So all of this kind of uh, other flows of ideas and power structures and so on. Uh, and I would like to hear a bit more about that and maybe to historicize it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The way I would historicize it is exactly as you say, the turn to effect is a kind of late, slightly later manifestation of a much earlier, more decisive turn that we might identify as the, the post-critical or projective. Uh, we might think about, you know, before other people started saying we have to turn to Deleuze, we have Jeff Kipnis talking about this in his, uh, you know, pseudo-ironically titled Towards a New Architecture. And one of the mad things that I, I tried to do in the book, in an earlier chapter, is to do a kind of critical history of the history of theory from 68 to the present day, and uh, obviously I try and be fairly concise, but I say, following what other people have said, that from 68, there's a kind of madness of theory, as uh, Francois Cusset calls it, not just in architecture, everywhere. And you can look at Lyotard, you look at Baudrillard, every time kind of saying, oh, the last book wasn't quite, you know, there, this is how far we've gone away from reality. Reality doesn't exist anymore. We're in several levels of, uh, you know, hyper hyper reality. But also from, I think, very, you know, perhaps more significantly, um, the influence of gender studies, feminism, uh, post-colonial studies, 
all these things kind of find their way into architecture. There's a lot of architectural writing about these things in, in the 80s and some way into the 90s. And then it seems that certain people position themselves, within, especially within American academia, to say, enough, no more. Michael Speaks puts it best. He says, uh, theory was interesting. Now we have work. <laughs> And it's this, I think it's kind of realisation of, this is like really interesting for theorists and for getting books published, all this kind of dalliance with, with Derrida and, and, and so on. But we want, we want actually to be architects now. And Deleuze, not his fault, but Deleuze comes along, that seems a lot more kind of spatial. You know, the stuff about folding yeah. rather than yeah. Derrida, what's he really on about anyway, but it's something to do with language. So there is a, there's a move, so I would historicise it and say, okay, so 68 till the early 90s, a kind of a free-flowing theory, which is kind of, in one part, crazy, but in another part, starts to address some really disconcerting things for architecture. Um, and then the early 90s, when there's this move, and we're still in this, this is the longest period, we're talking about postmodernism. but think how long we've been in a broadly kind of Deleuzean, projective architectural moment from the 90s, still ongoing to the present day, and Sylvia Lavin still bringing up the same old arguments about wasn't mo modernism terrible? Yeah, but it kind of, that's decades ago, but still kind of triumphantly kind of claiming that it's over now. Setting up a straw man. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it also seems that there might be an opportunity to go back to this period of theory frenzy and um, you know, do more of just the hard work of um, going back through the text, seeing what we've overlooked, mm. uh, especially because in architecture we're terribly greedy with our consumption of concepts. There's no yeah. doubt about it. And so the trajectory that you've mapped out, we gobble up Deleuze, we uh, gobble up Derrida, we move on to Deleuze, we, you know, yeah. it's always the next best thing. It's mm. kind of bad habit. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said for slowing right down. Mm. And so I'm interested in your project of, no, well, let's slow down and go back and read Adorno because we might have overlooked yeah. or we're making assumptions or we're reading secondary literature and still making the same old assumptions and overlooking yeah. something that we might benefit from. Mm. Um, and for me it's still, you know, there's, there's been, there's been um, obviously Deleuze is a dangerous thinker but there's been a really, really unfortunate reception of him mm. in, in architecture okay. and it's, and, yeah. and it's um, a history of receptions mm. that take him and turn him into sort of a, you know, a novel form for the sake of novel form that will think for itself. Yeah. Um, whereas there is a political and ethical project there that can, that can be really um, valuable to us, I don't really want to argue. But um, yes, question. Yeah, another, perhaps more of a, this on. Perhaps more of a comment um, than anything else, but this is a bit of an odd discussion in some way because the question is, is what's the right theory for architecture? Maybe that's not the right question. Be because, because it's, aren't we making the assumption that the way that the rose is being imported into architectural discourse leads to a very uncritical approach? Aren't we then assuming that if we import critical theory that we're critical? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I would rather doubt that because mm -hmm. if you look at what happened in the 80s and 90s, to how certain projects that were, in my view, entirely uncritical, were kind of um, legitimized through name dropping of sure. critical theories, right? So I think this is kind of more a kind of inherent problem of how we think about architectural discourse mm -hmm. and its relationship mm -hmm. to a, a larger world yeah. in which we live. Yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of overemphasizing its importance. In fact, this is minute and irrelevant to many people. Um, so which, which part are we overemphasizing? Our concerns around discourse. theory or architectural I think, discourse? I mean, listening to your talk, I'm always thinking like, this is how could we? This is ludicrous, right? It's kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. that we even that we even take this serious. This kind of salesmanship of um, architecture, architects using this kind of mm -hmm. terminology to sell their projects. Also. But I was so sorry. So I, I just wonder about the relationship between theory and architectural discourse and the architectural profession. If we yeah. cannot reorganize or think about that relationship differently, in which case we would use theory. Yeah. I mean, I, two 
immediate responses to that. Uh, one of them, uh, a bit anecdotal, uh, some of the, the teaching I'm doing uh, in history, I teach history and theory. Uh, I would, a student came to me and said, I, I want to write my thesis about Farshid Musavi and affect and how great it is. And I said to her, well, I have a very different opinion, but being a good tutor, I hope, I said, but why, I would ask you at least just to kind of question what it actually means and whether it works. And she said, well, I feel really awkward doing that because our whole studio, our whole year, is taking her writing as the basis for my projects. So it does have a real influence. And I think a lot of my motivation is, is seeing what architectural students are being taught and trying to kind of smash that in a way, trying to... It's a pedagogical it's trying responsibility. To undermine yeah. I think there's a pedagogical responsibility, and that's why we still have to undertake these forms of kind of articulation, you know, ad addressing the impact, because, yeah, exactly yeah. for these reasons. I, I, I completely yeah. agree. And, and the other, just very quick response, is this is where I have to put my kind of disciplinary specific hat on and say, I am not an architect. This is my easy getter, okay? So I am not looking to prescribe how architects should work with theory um, with that word Frederick Jameson, but I'm more someone who's trying to, you know, understand something about the world through architecture. That's my interest in architecture, is I'm kind of, yeah, trying to understand it as a kind of mediation. But I am profoundly interested and invested in architectural education as well. Some, uh, some more questions? Yeah, and I saw one over there. Oh, I think we've got Helen and then we've got Liam. Um, maybe, I guess my, uh, my question maybe builds on the last one, but thank you so much for the, the lecture. It was fantastic. Um, but maybe we could think, rather than um, critical theory, we might think about this critical attitude more generally that Foucault describes as kind of endemic to liberalism. Um, if liberalism is this an effort to govern not too much and not too little, it implies a critical attitude in weighing up that, that decision, right? Um, so it's about limitation. But I was interested in um, the notion of self-limitation because under neoliberalism, as we kind of touched on today, there's a self-governance that's happening there. Um, so we might assume the presence of a kind of self-critique also. Um, so that was my first question, is how does self-critique map into this uh, affect discussion? And then... Yeah. Oh. The second part of the question then, sorry for having a two-part question, is if, if self-critique is important, it kind of points to this like, biographical um, dimension. And that, for me, I wonder if you could comment on sort of bios and Zoe and that whole biopolitical division, because we're kind of being individualised at the same time that we're relying on this pre-personal, yeah. much more shared kind of conception of life. So... Yeah. Self-critique and then, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having two questions and both being <laughs> really difficult. Um, I don't know, I, I wonder if it's worth reiterating the, the distinction between criticism and critique. And understanding critique as, that is why I kind of went boringly, but rapidly, through the history of critique, which is not a history of criticism. So it's a kind of self-criticism where you're kind of nagging away at yourself and kind of, you know, perhaps um, saying, you know, you have to do better. There's that, but that's, that's not critique, as I would understand it. Um, that, that's more kind of criticism. Most people don't distinguish between the two things. But, uh, you know, that's like the negative side of affect as well, about kind of being made to feel like you're never doing well enough, that you're not productive enough. So we do I absolutely acknowledge this is like a really kind of basic mechanism of how neoliberalism or whatever we want to call it operates. But a production of insecurity and then not the sales of Xanax. Yeah. So yeah. And then the Zoe Bios thing. I, yeah, one of the things I kind of detect with this reference to the pre-personal and other notions of the, the, the affirmation of affect 
is, wouldn't it be good if we didn't have to think? I think this is its understandable appeal. You know, and I certainly feel like this today, having got up at four o'clock this morning, and I've had about eight coffees to keep me going, and then I've been listening to other people's presentations and thinking about my presentation, and my brain is like a, well, it's just chaotic at the moment. And so you can think, it'd be nice to have some time off from that. So that's the appeal of all these, um, you know, invitations. You know, art's always presented as good, or it's immersive, or immerse yourself in this soundscape. Yes, it has an appeal, and you have to understand, this is what I meant about critical theory, or whatever we want to call it, having to be responsive to the conditions now, is to understand why that, that is an appeal to us, and why it is appealing to us to kind of lose ourselves. Um, but, yes, the risk is, and it might sound slightly paranoid and a bit kind of dystopian, but further down the line, what sort of conditions does this kind of ask us to reproduce ourselves to? The kind of almost like animal condition. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, again, Douglas, for all the talk. Um, I've got first a kind of observation to turn into a question. You, you give us um, a sort of motif, if you like, which I'm trying to think as a, almost like a renunciation of renunciation in this, this suicide. Like, um, being critical was about renouncing affect, so that, yeah. that's all the effect of what I'm to present it kind of elegantly. That always takes the form of saying, thou shalt renounce, renounce thinking. Yes. Yeah. There's a sort of kind of double movement in the PR material yes. that we look at. But I wonder if it's operative to some degree within the architecture itself and then we can take a kind of easy target and in future system self-reduce. Yes. And it's got a sort of quote effective um, envelope because we know it's just going to be a department store. It's going yeah. to be a kind of fluorescent lights and inside. I, I does what is its affective dimension seems there precisely to can cover a, a lack of effective, affective um, dimension within the actual spatial configuration. Of it. Yeah. But I, I'm just, the sort of question would be, I, I think somebody, I don't know if you know Mark Linda and his writings on Geary, in a way, kind of theorizes this double movement in the sense that he speaks about Geary's work not simply as um, something that is actually about trying to engage with a kind of immediate effect, but actually about an unworking of a linguistic effect. So say right. when we take Schinkel and we screw it up into a paper ball, yes. you know, we're kind of we're trying to do something to unwork language. Yeah. And he theorizes this through the notion of the, the non-linguistic and uh, psychoanalytic experience, mm -hmm. actually, the kind of the, the actually how unsettling it is to be presented as a linguistic subject yes. with this non-linguistic situation mm. that actually asks us to kind of reflect and troubles us to think, yes. which, which I think is quite an interesting way of framing it. Yeah. Maybe. Thinking about the, the, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about the examples that are used as opposed to someone was talking about good examples earlier on, but it's mm -hmm. a question to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just seem really bad examples. Because if I do think about music, an immersive piece of music, mm. yeah. it feels kind of immersive. <laughs> it feels like I'm having some affective experience. Not entirely non-conceptual, but more to the, the affect side. But when I look at self which is palms from Birmingham, I just think music. Yeah, it's just it's just a pattern. But then I think if you start to criticize that or have a kind of critique of it. Yeah, it does, I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, but it does seem to be just an obfuscation, a kind of a refusal of the linguistic, a refusal of all meaning, which then actually approaches a kind of indifferent experience. It's why I was very interested in your talk earlier, from I'm thinking about the kind of meta-engineering stuff, the legacy of high tech which just seems to be an architecture of it. It does have affect, but it's just like super low level, calm down, indifference. It's not kind of especially dramatic. So it's kind of an invitation not to think or a kind of, you know, it's this, uh, this 
phraseology that kept coming up in what I was talking about, about you know, things just are as they are. End off. And, and that's where we're going to have to end off. And um, we all put our hands together for Doug, and then we're going to listen to Helen after that. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so very much for this performance. It was extremely interesting. Uh, however, uh, tomorrow morning we will uh, start at the Moderna Museum at 10 o'clock. So just to remind everyone, 10 o'clock at Moderna. And then on Saturday it's here again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.